On this week's show, Alex Small sits down with Headmaster Murray to discuss the school's new strategic plan, and Aidan Duffy interviews Princeton professor Julian Zelzer about the recent U.S. presidential election. Lauren Sill's 10-minute newscast begins right now. From the studios inside the Lawrenceville School's historic Pop Hall, this is L10 with Guy L. Phobes. Hello and welcome to this week's show. On Sunday, Irwin Dining Center staff member William Patterson passed away. Patterson, affectionately known to students and co-workers as Mr. Bill, was a beloved member of the staff and of the community as a whole. On behalf of the entire L10 News Board, we'd like to extend our thoughts and our condolences to Patterson's close family and friends during their time of grieving. Earlier this week, author Cindy Pierce visited campus to speak to various groups of students and faculty members. Pierce's talks focus on sexual relationships and social media and how each affect high schoolers in the 21st century. This week, second formers have been auditioning for this year's installation of Freshman Shakespeare. In February, students casted will perform Romeo and Juliet in the Kirby Arts Center Black Box. Several student events are, are on schedule for this weekend. Tonight, Laurentians will celebrate the beginning of the winter sports season with Red and White Night. On Saturday, the school will host the annual Winter Carnival and Rumble in the Arena. On Sunday, student musicians will perform at the jazz concert. Over Thanksgiving break, Headmaster Murray released new details on Lawrenceville's new strategic plan titled Lawrenceville 2020. Our senior news correspondent, Alex Small, had the opportunity to sit down with Murray to discuss the plan. Thank you, Mr. Murray, for joining us. Um, over the fall vacation, you sent out Lawrenceville's new strategic plan uh, titled Lawrenceville 2020. Um, the 14-page plan um, kind of entails what the plan for Lawrenceville is. Um, however, some might see it as a bit too abstract or conceptual. Mm -hmm. um, to that, how will, and in the near future, uh, will we see the Lawrenceville community uh, directly feel this impact? Well, it's a strategic plan uh, rolls out over five, seven, eight years typically, and so this one will will play out over time. I would say the more immediate plans that might begin to affect students would be, for example, our Pace of Life Task Force, which we have just launched, which will be a largely a faculty-driven uh, initiative, but will certainly directly affect the lives of students in the coming months. Um, the task force is going to be working over the next 18 months actually to take a comprehensive look at longer term changes but there could be some short term things in, in the works as well. Okay and so on that um, the copy in the vision statement um, it talks about redefining uh, kind of the academic life at Lawrenceville um, and maintaining the idea that we'll have a strong meditative and reflective experience at Lawrenceville. How can we engage that without compromising the academic rigor here? Well, it's a great question, and I think the task force on pace of life will be digging in to, you know, as I said, try to understand what it is we're trying to solve. But for example, when you think about rigor, I mean, I think we need to have a conversation about what constitutes rigor. So for example, is rigor simply more homework? Could rigor be, instead of reading eight Shakespeare plays in a term, maybe you read four, and maybe you dig more deeply into a play. Maybe a homework assignment is not read an entire play, maybe to go home and write for 40 minutes on a single line from Hamlet, but think deeply and with a certain amount of discipline and try to unpack the entire line. After 40 minutes, stop. And the next day you come into class and you discuss the directions that each of you took as you try to dissect that line. I mean, that's, that's rigor also. Um, in the second part of the strategic policy, um, we talk about energizing the academic culture um, one way we plan on doing that is through having hands-on learning um, as a way for Lauren Laurentians to have an experiential education. Um, what specific skills and lessons can we learn from hands-on learning uh, that we wouldn't otherwise? So I think of experiential hands-on learning, or I call, I call it roll-up-your-sleeves learning. I think it, we do a fair amount of that already. We have a tremendously strong and vibrant Harkness culture, and I like the idea of having more complementary programs that allow students to apply their learning from the classroom, which often is more abstract. So this is the hands-on roll up your sleeves. If you think about Hutchins scholars or Healy scholars, any of the science research we already do, foreign travel, we already have a lot of ways uh, in which students can apply their learning. I think the learning sticks better. I think you have a deeper, more dimensional understanding of what you've been learning when you can apply it. So moving forward, adding to those kinds of programs, certainly. Also looking at Groose Arts Center and thinking of that space not simply as a wonderful 
set of studios for visual arts, but adding to it what I would call a center for creative design. Some people call it a maker space, where you could have, where it would be interdisciplinary. You can have uh, digital design elements along with um, what I would call, um, you know, when you say a maker space, you think about, um, you know, kind of uh, what they call manual arts, I guess it's for lack of a better word, but woodworking, metalworking, plasma cutters, even welding, different ways to, to, um, uh, to make things. Okay, um, and it talks about the science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, and that kind of roll up your sleeves of education. Um, what would that education look like in non-STEM classrooms, such as English history and foreign language? Well, so that's a great uh, question. I've already talked to some colleagues. The, one of my language department uh, colleagues came up and said, you know, that um, virtual reality studios are kind of at the cutting edge for language learning. So different ways to create very real simulated environments for language learning. For example, in the humanities, we already have courses like Design for Social Change, where there are opportunities to prototype and build models that are solutions to real world problems that um, confront humans. And so trying to expand on that type, those types of courses where I wouldn't call them technology-based, really more uh, humanity or human-based. Human and um, I can imagine an expansion of curriculum there. Okay. Um, and so we will see effects in the next coming years um, to address all sorts of those things in the next 18 months, you say? Yeah, I mean, the, the pace of life is under the heading of community. And so we are looking at uh, redesigning and rethinking the field house. It's a building that is badly in need of being replaced. We're looking at how we come together as a community in dining. Uh, so could we enhance our ability to come together over meals? And then we're looking at pace of life, which, you know, the question being, does the busyness of Lawrenceville sometimes get in our way of, of uh, living as a community? Okay. Um, and then I know another firm or program that we've been um, employing or been in contact with is the Sasaki Associates, who have been designing um, the inner workings of our school. Um, what contributions do you think that they will have to the school? Um, and how will the new physical plan for the school kind of... Uh, institute this idea of the larger Lawrenceville 2020 mission? So Sasaki Associates is, a, a, is another world-class firm. They are, uh, they are a, I mean, they certainly do architectural design. That's what they're known for, but they're also known for doing campus planning, urban planning. They look at the whole ecosystem of an, the human ecosystem of an institution and look at how people move across a campus, how they inhabit a campus, how they interact, how architecture can build community and can help create culture, they're really good at it. And so they will be doing a campus master plan for us. I see that as part of the spade work or foundation work for then implementing some of the um, proposals in the plan. So, you, so you're right in saying that el certain elements of the plan are not fully defined, and that's because they aren't fully developed yet. The, the concepts are there, but you do need to do the work to really understand where you need to go with it. And so a really good campus master plan, for example, can help us see some of the opportunities around the field house, around ways to come together through dining, um, how to think about traffic flow. One of the notions, for example, is could we ever eliminate cars from the center of campus? Could this really be a, a pedestrian campus and really be about human traffic, not car traffic? And would that help create better community, things like that. So Sasaki will be looking at all those kinds of questions. It's not a to-do list. They simply identify possibilities and opportunities, and then it's up to us to decide which ones we will implement. Um, and then lastly, do you have anything you want to say to the student body um, as we begin our winter term um, regarding what we'll see in the 2020 plan? Yeah, I mean, you know, in some ways, you haven't asked about the mission. The plan begins with the mission because as you look at strategically helping a, an institution to evolve, which is what a, st a strategic plan does. One of the ways to frame that is to begin by looking at your enduring purpose. So what's our identity? Who do we, how do we articulate who we are in a more of a transcendent way? And so we began by looking at the mission and then we crafted the vision for the future, which is what the plan then articulates. 
and I hope in the coming weeks to roll out the mission to the student body. I did introduce it briefly back in August, but now it's been approved. And in some ways, it might be a simple notion, but I think the way we talk about who we are helps frame the culture, helps frame how we work together, students, faculty, staff. And so I'm hoping the, the mission itself will have an impact that is felt by, by the students. Thank you, Alex. On Wednesday night, Princeton University Professor of History and Public Affairs and CNN contributor Julian Zelzer visited Lawrence Hole to discuss the outcome of the recent U.S. presidential election. Our senior sports correspondent, Aiden Duffy, had a chance to ask Zelzer a few additional questions about the election. In a column for CNN.com after the election, you looked at key parts of President-elect Trump's style. Um, can you help us understand how he connected with the American people? And what did he see in voters that perhaps others missed? Some of it was the way he connected, which is important to understand. He figured out ways to use the social media. He figured out ways uh, to communicate in cable television that were very effective, where he was able to shape the conversation in a way that Hillary Clinton struggled. In terms of his message, part of it was appealing to American workers who are struggling in the modern economy and making a better pitch that uh, he would offer them relief in contrast to his opponent, part of it was a more negative tone, both in terms of vilifying Hillary Clinton, literally calling her a criminal at different points in the campaign, but also playing to some of the underside of American politics, racism, xenophobia, nativism. So economist Stephen Moore said on NPR yesterday that the Republican Party is no longer the party of Ronald Reagan and free trade. Uh, as someone who studied the Reagan years, can you talk about how President-elect Trump's victory may change the Republican Party? So uh, President-elect Trump and his team, one who define the Republican Party around blue-collar concerns rather than around the concerns of wealthier Americans, part of that uh, involves the promise of jobs creating programs like infrastructure bills, and part of it is an attack on free trade, which has been a staple of Republican politics. But in the first a week and a half or so after the victory, a lot of his team looks like a very traditional Republican party. It just looks like a very conservative set of foreign policy and domestic policy. Yeah, so on the flip side, how will Trump's victory change the Democratic Party? And what do you think Democrats will do to sort of counteract his policy changes? Well, the loss was so stunning and so shocking, it's generated an internal debate uh, within the Democratic Party. One part of that debate, is that the party needs to do more to deal with the economic concerns that seem to be front and center in states like Michigan and Wisconsin. Part of it is a debate over what people call identity politics. As Democrats focus too much on issues of identity and protecting uh, everyone's identity at the expense of these other core issues. Uh, and so that's the debate right now. I don't know which way the party will go. Uh, but counteracting that is the fact that Hillary Clinton did so well in the popular vote, uh, winning by over two and a half million votes, uh, and even doing well in states like Georgia and Utah, red states where Democrats did better. So I don't think it's going to be automatic that the party changes. Uh, but I do think there'll be more attention paid to some of the basic economic concerns of middle class Americans that since the 1990s, the Democrats have certainly not done as much on as they used to in the 30s through the 60s. So one final question. Um, do you have any advice for students dealing with the unprecedented sort of shock and awe due to this election cycle? Um, and how can students have meaningful discussions in a polarized environment? Sure, I've talked to a lot of students since the election took place, and it's the first election I can remember where people feel as if they need to talk about it, that something happened that shouldn't have happened, and what do you do? My biggest advice is this should not be a reason to turn away from politics. Uh, whatever party you are, if you didn't like the nature of the campaign, if you don't like the nature of the victor, uh, that, and you feel like we're in a state of maybe crisis in this nation or uncertainty, I tell students that's exactly the moments in American history where young people need to get involved, not to opt out of the political system in whatever capacity they can. And we need students in the world of journalism who are interested in that, uh, in the world of organizations to create spaces uh, where we can have good reality-based discussions about what's going on. I think it's more important now than ever. So the main message is this is the time to tune in. This is the time to become energized, not to go the other way. 
That is our show for Friday, December 2nd, 2016. From all of us here at L10, thank you so much for watching as we start this new term. Good night.